So I'm going to start with uh, one forester's personal story. And uh, it's a bit of a forest and fish story of my own. Um, my personal passion is connecting people with their natural resources. I've always loved the sciences, but it was more than just the science. It was the interface with people and those really uh, curious, sometimes very tough questions at how people interact with their natural resources. It was a true passion of mine, and that passion started right here in Kitsap County, about uh, 20 miles south of here, uh, near Olala, as Elaine said, uh, I grew up uh, across the country, the little country lane from the King B Kingsbury family's Five Springs tree farm. So here's the story. I was a very shy, let me repeat, very shy, nine-year-old girl where my parents uh, were living their family dream uh, to uh, move their family out to the country to be raised closer to nature. So they purchased 10 acres of land and we built our home uh, across from this tree farm. Um, and it was our opportunity to connect with nature. So here's how the story goes. First, the forest. I have vivid, vivid memories of my sister and I playing in those big, big old growth cedar stumps. Fire had come through in the early part of the century, so they were fire charred and they were all hollowed out. And we had hours of camps and, and imagination in these, uh, in these cedar stumps. And we learned about that they were nurse stumps and there was these big second growth forests, trees uh, growing out of these stumps. Mother can take us to those very stumps still today. We also spent hours down at the creek, Purdy Creek, an anandromous fish stream where Wendy and I would cheer on and we'd often name each salmon that was swimming upstream to their final resting place to spawn. In fact, we felt like we were fairly righteous and we were giving them their final blessing. <laughs> and then it came time to build the family home. Originally, we we're gonna build down by the creek. We wanted to be by the water. But we saw, uh, and we didn't call it ecosystem back then, but you know, we saw the connection to the creek. And uh, mother, mother can probably tell you more, but uh, all I knew is after some family meetings, we decided we were gonna build up on the hill. And so this is where this very shy, externally at least, little girl wasn't so shy with her father. And uh, dad was in, in heavy construction and he brought the equipment out to, you know, decide how to clear the site for the, the home. And I put my hands on my hips and my father and I negotiated every single tree that we were going to take. <laughs> because I proclaimed that I was going to be a forester and I also called it a conservationist because I saw those two things as very interchangeably and I still do today. And that uh, I proclaimed that we needed to make wise choices about which trees we were going to remove for this family home. So that's my very, very simple forest and fish story. Now, it doesn't stop there. And then we met Mr. John Kingsbury, who was out tending his 100-acre tree farm across the little country lane. He was so pleasant. And I don't know if he realizes it, but he gave my sister and I a huge gift. He gave us access 
to our own learning laboratory. The tree farm where we explored for hours riding our horses, and yes, we had little motorcycle dirt bikes, on the many roads and trails in the tree farm. As long as we were responsible about closing the gates, and we often reported things uh, like garbage dumping to him, we heard were his own little forest rangers that we took as very responsible. And that's where my personal pa passion of conservation of natural resources began, in the connection with the family tree farm, the Kingsberries, and on our own small little 10 acres of heaven. So those early experiences inspired me to study forestry at the University of Washington. And I first worked during the summer as a state uh, firefighter for Washington D DNR. And the DNR district manager, the big boss, was John Kingsbury. He was the district manager for DNR. So Mr. Kingsbury not only gave us access to his tree farm, but he also gave me my first start as a wildland firefighter. Today, it's very daunting to know that um, I'm the chief of the world's largest firefighting force for wildland firefighting. So after graduating from University of Washington, I began uh, a nearly 27-year career with Washington DNR. And you know, one of my most heartfelt memories were those hours out on uh, family forest tree farms, doing, uh, helping them write their forest stewardship plans. Back then, we still called them service forestry plans. We called them plans on how to be good stewards of the land. Whether it was over the kitchen, the, the, the kitchen table with all the maps or the, the hood of the pickup, but really understanding what was in the heart and the soul of these family forest uh, landowners and what they wanted to achieve from their lands. And as a professional forester, how I could help uh, uh, realize that by helping them write a plan. Those are deep felt memories that to this day in that other place inside the Beltway that I still carry with me today. Another significant career memory is working alongside many in this room and many that were in the room earlier today in um, implementing the forest and fish law. You know, building on the foundation of the Timber, Fish, and Wildlife Agreement that law struck a balance between competing uses. The founder of the Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, once put it this way. There are many great interests on the national forests which sometimes conflict a little. <laughs> sometimes conflict a little? That was an understatement, even a hundred years ago when most Americans still had strong rural connections and the western states were still only parsely, sp sparsely populated. By the 1990s, the Pacific Northwest was a different place and it was torn by conflict over forest uses. Do people want salmon or timber? Do people want clean water, outdoor recreation? And we know none of these are mutually exclusive, but many people thought so at the time. So the genius of the forest and fish agreement was that it cut through the Gordian knot. It ended the zero-sum game of I'm right and you're wrong. Forests and fish discovered common ground a way of getting to yes. I know, I've been away 10 years, it's still a slog, but when you step away and you see what you all have accomplished, it is really incredible. Yes, 
people want salmon. Salmon is our signature species, vital to our regional culture and heritage. Salmonids depend on clean, cold water and on good habitat in healthy streams and rivers, from the headwaters down to the sound and the ocean. And, yes, we all live in wood-framed homes. So we all need timber from sustainably managed forests, a green building material much better for the environment than concrete and steel. And yes, most private lands are in family ownerships. And if we want to keep them forested and sustainably managed for generations to come, then we need to make sure that their owners can make sound investments with sustainable financial returns. All right. Yes. So 20 years ago, forests and fish struck a balance between these competing interests by saying yes, by validating all of the above. Of course, the law was the first step. I came in from the field as the assistant division manager for forest practices, just as the emergency rules were rolling out. So then there was the process of adopting the permanent rules and the development of the historic HCP. It wasn't easy, folks. There were many, many long debates, and I learned today they're still happening. Equitability and parity of forest and fish was one of the many struggles we wrestled with, especially for family forest landowners. This was recognized by the state legis legislature, and I was part of standing up the first small forest landowner office. I'm pleased to say I hired Steve Stinson as our first director. And Sherry Fox was a part of our interview panel, the first time we had asked a non-DNR employee to help us select what would represent the Small Forest Landowner Office. All these years later, I'm still very proud of Forest and Fish, and I thank those who led the way for their vision and foresight. I so enjoyed the panel this morning that uh, shared the insights of what that took. Forests and Fish is a model for the nation, one of the largest and most comprehensive environmental measures in the United States. I get to see it from a different perspective, folks. It really is incredible. It covers 60,000 miles of stream on 9.3 million acres of state and private forest land. It complies with both the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act. It protects Washington's native fish and aquatic species as well as water quality through monitoring and adaptive management. Oh, how we love that. But it really is innovative. It really is. And it accommodates private forest landowners, giving them surety on their lands and acknowledging the critical role they play in protecting and preserving values that all of our citizens share. They may not know it, Ken, but folks in the cities really do benefit from forest lands. And we're not going to stop till they all realize how much they benefit. So I've taken the lessons and the innovations from Forest and Fish into my position as Arizona State Forester and now as my role as Chief of the United States Forest Service. You know, the mission of the Forest Service is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands for the benefit of current and future generations. As you know, the Forest Service manages the national forests and grasslands. It's an area almost twice the size of California, 
193 million acres in 44 states and Puerto Rico. Here in Washington, the national forests comprise 9.3 million acres, or about 20% of the state, mostly at higher elevations to, pr to protect the headwaters of streams. Watershed protection is vitally important because people need water to live. 38% of the drinking water in the Pacific Northwest comes from the national forests. Here in Washington, 86% of the population is served by a very few large public water systems. And nearly all of them draw their water from the national forests. But our mission at the Forest Service extends beyond the national forests. It extends to the nation's forests and grasslands. And we work with state and private partners nationwide to support sustainable forest management across our nation. The key words in our mission statement are to sustain. And conservation, or the wise use of, has always been at the core of our mission. More than a century ago, under visionary leaders like President Teddy Roosevelt, we decided as a nation to leave a legacy of forests for our children and grandchildren. We developed methods and models for the sustainable use of America's forest resources across landscapes, on state and federal lands, on tribal lands, and on private lands. Today, we share a belief that forests are vital to families and communities, that forests are a broad social good, vital to our national prosperity, to our well-being as Americans. All Americans, whether they own forest lands or not, benefit from our nation's forest resources. And we're going to continue to carry that message. Forests provide sustenance, including 53% of the nation's drinking water. In fact, private forests alone supply 30% of our nation's drinking water. And let's not forget, forests are the indispensable source of green energy and green building materials. Private forests alone supply 90% of our nation's domestically produced forest products. Forests are also a part of our cultural heritage. Forests are a place of privacy, of peace, and seclusion and great natural beauty. Forests are home to many Americans, part of their family legacy. Places where they can enjoy with friends and family. Places where they can indulge in the great American traditions of hunting and fishing. A place where the Kingsburys have passed down their family legacy to the next generation just as many as you have. And a place where my mother is able to stay 87 years young by tending to her little piece of paradise with her creek and forests. All of this is possible because America's forest landowners and land managers long ago embraced the sustainable use of forest resources. Thanks to Teddy Roosevelt and other early conservationists, a third of our nation's land area is still forested today. In fact, we have the world's fourth largest forest estate. And most of our forest estate, about 56%, is privately owned, unlike in most countries around the world. Private forest land makes up about 445 million acres, more than twice the size of the entire national forest system. America has more than 10.7 million family forest ownerships on about 290 million acres, or about 36% of our nation's forest land. 
Washington alone has uh, nearly 48,000 private forest ownerships of 10 acres or more. These lands cover a total of 2.2 million acres, mostly at lower elevations, where they protect vital watersheds by buffering forests at higher elevations from residential areas. These lands are threatened by land conversions to developed uses. So the Forest Service is working with many partners to do everything we can to keep these family forest lands forested. But land conversions is not the only challenge facing family forests. Other challenges include habitat loss and forest degradation associated with a changing climate, including bark beetle outbreaks and invasive species such as gypsy moss, balsam, balsam woolly, adelgid, scotch broom, knapweeds, and more are threatening both forests and grasslands. One national challenge <laughs> is wildfire. Our nation has over a billion burnable acres of vegetated landscapes. Most of them are naturally adapted to periodic wildland fire. About 80 million acres on the national forest system overall are at risk, and about a third of that area is at high risk. Hundreds of millions of acres of other lands are also at risk, whether state, private, county, tribal, or other federal lands. We are all in this together. In the last two years alone, wildfires burned almost 19 million acres nationwide and destroyed more than 26,000 residents. Worse, more than 100 people died in wildfire entrapments, often while fleeing their homes. Over the last few decades, the western fire season has grown at least two and a half months longer, and we have seen the frequency, size, and severity of wildfires increase. Primary drivers are climate change, drought, hazardous fuel buildups, and the spread of homes and communities into fire-prone landscapes. In fact, large parts of the West are in the new normal for fire activity, where a full suite of environmental, social, political, financial, and cultural factors drive outcomes in the wildland fire environment. The wildland fire system we have today is incredibly complex that no single entity can do it alone. Not the Forest Service, not the states, not any given fire department. We are all in this wildland fire system together. A decade ago, the entire wildland fire community decided to come together to draft a common vision for improving our wildland fire system. I was involved as state forester in Washington and later in Arizona. And we developed a truly shared approach called the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy. Our approach has three national goals. Restoring and maintaining resilient landscapes. Creating fire adapted communities and a safe and effective wildfire response with decisions based on risk analysis for all ownerships. Our co cohesive strategy for wildland fire is part of being a good neighbor, a national priority for the Forest Service. Being good neighbors takes active management, using every tool and authority we have to improve the health of America's forests. The tools we have include timber sales, targeted grazing, herbicides in some cases, stewardship contracts, and prescribed fire. Our tools also include fire prevention programs such as community wildfire protection plans and firewise practices for homes and communities to reduce the risk of the catastrophic wildfire.
The authorities we have include the appropriate use of environmental assessment and decision making, using sound science and data to make sound decisions. In this past year, Congress has given the Forest Service new authorities to improve the conditions of America's forests. For example, we now have expanded stewardship contracting authority for up to 20 years. We really need a market solution to treat the millions of acres of small diameter trees that need to be removed to improve forest health. And this, these 20 year contracting authority will attract the needed investments in biomass and small wood processing. We have also expanded good neighbor authority to include states and tribes. Through the Good Neighbor Authority, we can pool our resources for all kinds of fuels and forest health treatment on federal land and adjacent lands, as well as for projects uh, related to wildlife habitat, soil and water, and data collection. So we now have 166 Good Neighbor Agreements on 56 national forests in 36 states, and it's really increasing our ability to get much needed good work done on the ground. So with these tools and authorities to improve forest conditions in 2018, the Forest Service, with this help of others, we treated nearly 3.5 million acres through timber sales, prescribed fire, the highest levels ever. We sold 3.2 billion board feet of timber, the most in 20 years, creating jobs through a sustainable flow of forest products. Thank you. Thank you. But you know, folks, this isn't enough. We can't stop here, and it can't be business as usual. Another priority for the Forest Service is promoting shared stewardship by increasing our partnerships. We need others to help us make a difference across the landscapes. So we are committed to working with partners and landowners to accomplish work on the nation's forests in the spirit of shared stewardship. We believe that joining together across shared landscapes and around shared values, it's critical for the future of conservation. The reason is simple. The scale of our work has to match the scale of the risks and the problems that we face in this nation. For example, salmon S salmon face risks ranging from the oceans to the headwaters of the streams and all points in between. If we want to have salmon, we need to mitigate risk by working with partners at the appropriate scale. So Forest and Fish is a great example of coming together to work at the right scale at the risk of our salmon fisheries. So now we have the opportunity to match the scale of our work to the scale of the fire risks we face as well. In the past, our projects were randomly scattered across landscapes because no one was able to get their arms around the problem of fire risk. If a severe fire came, the project worked. The fire dropped from the canopy to the forest floor where firefighters can control it before it burned into homes and communities. But we had no good way of assessing the full scale of the risk and placing our treatments accordingly. Now we have the tools for understanding a whole range of conditions at landscape scale. Today's mega fires can travel for many miles to threaten homes, communities, and other critical values. The entire area at risk is called a fire shed, and scientists can now map entire fire sheds, including all federal, state, and private lands that make up the in individual fire shed. We can also map the contribution that fire risk has for 
for each parcel of land. And we can use that information to forecast what might happen if we put various kinds of treatments here or there. We can use the same approach for other kinds of threats like invasive species. Through planning at the right scale based on the outcomes we agree on for shared landscapes, we can place treatments of any, of any kind in a cost-effective way to achieve shared goals. We propose to apply the new technologies through shared stewardship with the states taking the lead. The states will convene all the critical partners to set broad priorities across shared landscapes for the outcomes we all want. Then we will use our new planning technologies to come up with agreements and commitments and the stakeholders to, do the, to have the right tools to use at the right time in the right places at the right scale. You know, the stars are aligned. Here in Washington, the state has a forest action plan, a forest health plan, and they can serve to coordinate fuels and forest health treatments across planning areas that span jurisdictional boundaries. The state is also uniquely positioned to convene stakeholders across the fire sheds to evaluate the wildland fire environment, to agree on cross-jurisdictional planning areas, you knew, use this new scenario planning tools to assess fire risk and alternatives for managing their risk. And they can set priorities for investments that will bring the most bang for the buck. The Forest Service has signed a shared stewardship agreement with the state of Idaho, and others will be signed soon. In fact, next week, I'll be coming back to the state to sign a uh, shared stewardship agreement with Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary France, and State Fish and Wildlife Director, Kelly Seswind, and myself for the Washington State Shared Stewardship Agreement. Forests and fish is a really good example of the capacity here in Washington for shared stewardship. The law produced a habitat conservation plan that brings together partners and stakeholders from across the landscapes to address risk at their appropriate scale based on common values and goals. Forest and Fish was an early model for the kind of shared stewardship we need now across the nation. In closing, family forest owners are the backbone of private forest land ownership in the United States. I got my own start in forestry from a family tree farm here in Washington. And I share the values and hopes of family forest owners as embodied in the Forest and Fish Agreement. The Forest Service shares your commitment to being a good steward and a good neighbor in recognizing the rights, values, and needs of stakeholders across the spectrum. I hope you will support us and our state partners here in Washington in working together across shared landscapes to match the scale of our work so we can reduce the risk at the right scale. And I can assure you that the Forest Service will do everything we can to sustain family forests for the benefits of many, many generations to come. Thank you very much.